We're ready. Go ahead. I think you're going to play the, the uh, promo. Okay. I'm not hearing any sound on that. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm really looking forward to it as well. You know, I. Dr. Morris, I am really looking forward to today's conversation. Well, yeah, me too, Tony. And Tony, let me take a chance to introduce you to a friend of mine, Dr. Uh, Praveen Akathota. I've known uh, Praveen for, uh, for many years, and he's our local expert in uh, the treatment of asthma, the management, both in the clinical setting and in the research setting. Uh, so, and, and uh, Dr. Akathota is going to be giving the talk tonight. Yeah, thanks, Tim. I'm really looking forward to it as well. You know, I, as you said, I take care of uh, a lot of asthma. That's what I do. That's, you know, what my passion is. And, you know, I wanted to, you know, just communicate to people about asthma, about, you know, what, what makes asthma tick, what makes, you know, why asthma happens. It's so common. Um, so I think it'll be interesting to a lot of people and then kind of transition into how do we take care of asthma? How can you keep yourself healthy uh, when you, when you have asthma? You know, what kind of medications do you use? What other things can you do, um, you know, beside medications to keep yourself healthy? Well, Dr. Arkathoda, it is uh, extremely awesome to have you uh, with us today. And I know for a kid who grew up with asthma, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of people out there that could, uh, could use this useful information. Thanks, Tony. Great. Well, looking forward to the talk. Thanks again, you guys. All right. Well, uh, who was that handsome host uh, there? Uh, so my name is Tim Morris, and I'm uh, the uh, chair of the American Lung Association Mission Committee. And the mission committee is uh, comprised of local experts in lung health from a variety of different walks of life who have banded together to help the Lung Association um, uh, accomplish its mission uh, towards, towards improving the lung health of the uh, people in San Diego and worldwide. Uh, one of the uh, functions of the mission committee is to perform these community connections, uh, which is now in its fourth season. Uh, and uh, the whole idea is that we are going to bring expertise right to you. And I want you to feel as if uh, you're having a doctor over for dinner. Uh, and uh, uh, hence the nickname of this, have a doctor for dinner. Um, these community co connections are made possible by a generous grant from the Burr Heart and Lung Clinic at Sharp uh, Grossman Hospital and the San Diego Foundation. Uh, we have a number of different uh, talks in the series. Uh, uh, today's is going to be about asthma management. Next week is going to be about environmental effects on lung health. We'll have a really nice uh, encore performance about culinary medicine. Uh, then the week following that, we'll talk a bit about vaping and smoking and flavored tobacco and synthetic tobacco. And then finally, we'll end up uh, with two talks uh, in the last two weeks about lung cancer screening, which actually coincides nicely with a, a global effort towards uh, decreasing uh, the incidence of lung cancer worldwide. Um, the format of this uh, uh, talk will be, we will first have a, a formal presentation and then uh, the speaker will be joined by members of the uh, ALA Mission Committee uh, who will uh, 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 encourage a bit of dialogue with you and um, with them. Um, but let me, uh, without further ado, I introduce Dr. Uh, Agathota. Um, Dr. Agathota is a good friend. He is a local expert in uh, asthma. He has devoted a large part of his career uh, towards uh, the treatment of asthma and asthma-related research, and it's really thrilling to have him here. So, Praveen? Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate the opportunity to, um, to talk to everybody today. Uh, I will you know, say that, uh, you know, with the dinner and the doc series, I, I wish I had a plate of food in front of me while I was talking to you, but we'll, we'll manage. Um, I think I need the screen release so I can share my slides here um, because, you know, we always like to share slides when we're having dinner with each other, um, but hopefully this are, these are helpful, um, helpful visual guides to what we're gonna be talking about uh, today. 
So, um, as I uh, and Dr. Morris, can you can you see my slides before I start rambling? Yes, we can. Great. Um, you know, as as I mentioned in the intro with uh, with, with Tony and with with Tim. Um, you know, asthma is something that I have a have a passion for. I spend a lot of my my time taking care of people with with asthma. That's you know what I was just just finishing my 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 asthma clinic here this this afternoon to and transitioning into talking with with every everybody. And I think um, you know some education about what asthma is, what the therapies that are available for asthma, what we can do beyond medications that might be helpful. These are all. Uh, you know all things that I'd like to you know, communicate to, to to everybody. So let's let's first talk talk about what what asthma is. You know we hear the word asthma you know thrown out a, a lot, but it's it's helpful to know that asthma is a disease of the airways or the air tubes that go into the into the lungs. So this is a picture here, a cartoon of somebody's lungs. So you can kind of see the the, the spongy part is this pink part of the lungs, but the, where the, how the air gets into the lungs is through this series of branching branching tubes or the or the airways, and those airways can sometimes get very tight. So this is the the airway kind of cut into into like the cross section of the, the pipe, and sometimes and this is what the airway looks like normally. It's nice and open. Air can get in and out of the lungs, but in in asthma the airways tighten up and. There's a, a ring of muscle around the, around these airways that can get um, that can constrict and close the airways off. And there's also a lot of inflammation that can happen and create mucus in the lungs and also further tighten the, the airway and the airflow that way. And that's you know that's fundamentally what asthma is. It's the air it's the airways going into the lungs, the smaller airways going into the lungs, getting constricted and tightened. And that's what leads to the, some of the, the symptoms that we that we see in, in asthma. Um, you know, asthma is really, we talk about asthma as one thing, but asthma is really a lot of things. It's uh, a lot of exposures in the environment that can lead to that tightening of the, of the airways. So everybody's a little bit different about what you know, particular trigger makes their asthma uh, worsen. And you know, um, in the asthma community, you'll hear some people say, it's not really asthma, but it's, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's asthmas, that there's all different types or flavors of asthma. Um, so, you know, in this picture here, you know, we, you can see some of the different triggers that can, um, that can lead to asthma. And there are things that you would think about commonly, a lot of things that uh, cause allergies also drive asthma. So allergy and asthma are very um, intimately related. So people can be uh, allergic to dust and that can drive their asthma. They can be uh, allergic to molds, you know, uh, things like black mold in the, in the, that you might see on drywall, uh, other, other mold in the environment that might, uh, that might trigger somebody's asthma. Some people are particularly sensitive to pollen. So, you know, at particular times of the year where, where things are, are blooming, where there's flowers blooming, that there's there's trees blooming, uh, there's different people whose asthma reacts badly to to that. So they may have different seasons where their asthma is worse. You know, they they have spring summer allergies. And, you know, it seems like in San Diego we have things blooming all the time. Back when I uh, lived on the on the East Coast, you know, there was a lot of this. That you know, in, in the springtime when things started to bloom. Um, people's asthma acted up, but uh, you know we have a lot of you know nice things blooming year round here in San Diego. Some people uh, react to to pets, dogs, cats. Those are common things that that trigger that trigger asthma in an allergic way. But it's not all just allergies. There's other irritants that you know. And if there's anybody who's listening to this now, or you know, or down the line on on uh, you know when it's posted. You know, this might all sound familiar. There are things in the in the air that are not al allergens, like somebody around you who smokes cigarettes. That you know, a strong perfume, just kind of chemical irritants. Things in your workplace. If you you know work somewhere, you know that has uh, fumes or chlorine or things like that. People who live near near pollution. If somebody lives near a um, a highway, all of those things are irritants that can that can trigger asthma. And um, 
There's other things that trigger asthma, like medications. Uh, interestingly, some people have a, a flavor of asthma where they respond very, uh, very, you know, badly to things like aspirin or um, ibuprofen. So any kind of pain relievers might might trigger their asthma. And very commonly, and, you, and again, people might, this might be very familiar to people. What we see a lot also is people who might have asthma from a lot of different things, but what really triggers them is when they get an infection. If they get a cold, some other kind of virus, then they get a bad, um, uh, a bad asthma attack or asthma flare. Some people have uh, milder forms of asthma that might be triggered by exercise. So, um, you know, when we see patients in our clinics, uh, uh, we, we hear this a lot that you know, when I go for a jog, I start to wheeze and I, and I um, can't, you know, push myself as hard as I think I, sh I should be able to. So there are exercise induced uh, flavors of asthma as well. So that was, you know, what we call, because Tony gave the, uh, gave the introduction, that's what we call a, a long run for a short slide to say that asthma is caused by a lot of different triggers. So I want to transition into just you know, reiterating that asthma is very common. That's why it's uh, you know, such a focus of ALA and the, and the pulmonary community and respiratory community in, in general, that, you know, you look at the numbers here on this slide, you know, there's millions of people across the world who are affected by asthma. And then by some estimates, there's um, uh, about one in 12 adults in the United States suffer from some, some sort of asthma. It could be relatively mild all the way uh, across the spectrum to more more severe asthma, and this is one of, asthma is one of those conditions where we see that there's disparities between different different groups. In particular, you know, you can see a couple of the arrows on my slide. Women are more affected by asthma than 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 men. Um, there are certain ethnic groups, black patients of black ancestry, uh, people of Puerto Rican ancestry, um, uh, all. Uh, they have increased incidence of asthma. This is data from the, uh, uh, from the CDC showing that uh, Black Americans and Puerto Rican Americans have higher rates of, of asthma than, uh, than, than other um, groups. And you know, why this may be is, is very, very complex, but uh, something that I think we, we need to do more, more research on um, in, the, in the future. And you know, with that, with asthma being so common, there's a there's a big burden to to, to asthma to, to society. Um, you know, there's a lot of visits to healthcare um, healthcare providers, outpatient visits, emergency room visits, hospital stays, and and yes, even uh, sometimes deaths from from asthma. So there's a, a large burden that ha that that asthma uh, has on on society. There's a large expense uh, as well. Asthma medications uh, cost. You know, this is one estimate from one paper. costs about three thousand bucks a year per, per per patient. So it's a really really hefty cost, and that that adds up with so many millions of people in the United States with uh, with asthma. And you know, if you add that all up, uh, you know, one 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 paper estimated that that costs fifty six billion dollars uh, a year, not just from the direct healthcare costs, but you know, things that are indirect, like people missing work or kids missing school. So asthma, you know, is something that uh, that still in, in 2022 uh, has a huge burden to, to society. And, you know, as I, as I said, there are um, that asthma is still, you know, even in 2022 can be fatal. It's a lot less so than it was, you know, 30 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago. But it is still um, it is still. Uh, pot uh, potentially a fatal disease. And we see some of those disparities in, in some of these statistics for, for asthma deaths as well. This again is, is CDC data um, in, from, from 2017 showing that uh, Black Americans have almost three times the, um, the, the death rate from asthma of, of, from other, other ethnic groups. So, you know, whether you know, there, wh why that is, is, is still, again, something that needs to be untangled, but we can, you know, make some suppositions about some of the things that go into um, people not doing as well as asthma. This is, you know, asthma is not just something that affects, you know, that's, it's not just a simple, um, you know, medical condition. This uh, asthma is something where the environment, uh, like we talked about pollution and triggers, 
and uh, somebody's social circumstance might affect how they do from uh, as far as their, their medical outcome. So I like this figure that, uh, that was published in a medical journal about 10 years ago, kind of um, underlining a lot of the things that go into some of the disparities that we see in, um, in asthma. Um, you know, there are things like, um, there, yes, there are things like genetics, but there are things like somebody's SES here is medical speak for social socioeconomic status. So somebody's economics and uh, might might impact their asthma. The um, you know the level of pollution that they're exposed to might might impact their asthma. Stress uh, and violence in the home might impact their asthma. We know that people who have you know, anxiety and depression are more likely to have asthma and vice versa, that people with asthma are more likely to have anxiety and, and depression. So there are, there are all sorts of things that, you know, feed into, you know, how somebody does as an individual with asthma. Um, and these might be clues to why, you know, there are disparities um, in, in asthma outcomes uh, in, in different, uh, different people in the, in the United States. So, all right, so that's kind of a little bit about, you know, asthma from a 30,000 foot view, but let's talk about asthma from a, an, an individual uh, perspective. So, you know, asthma is one of those things where, um, again, you know, we, we say asthma a lot and it's one of those things where we kind of know it when we see it, but it's important to um, talk about some of the specific, you know, signs uh, and symptoms that to, to look for. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking, you know, you might have asthma, you know, one of the things you might notice is shortness of breath. And that might be shortness of breath um, when you're trying to do activity that you're, you can't push yourself the way that you think you should. Um, or that might just be shortness of breath um, um, just when you're not doing anything. And that's the, and the thing about asthma to remember is, you know, asthma is not necessarily the same thing every day. It might be different one day to another, depending on you know, your exposure to triggers or, you know, a lot of just unknown things about how your body's reacting to the environment. So, you know, one day you might be doing well and the next day you might be short of breath, you know, kind of sitting and, and, and watching, watching television. So that's one of the, the, the signs of asthma. And, you know, very related is not just shortness of breath, but truly, you know, difficulty breathing, um, you know, that's kind of, almost the same, same thing, but on the severe end of the spectrum. Some people don't have as much shortness of breath or difficulty breathing, but their asthma might make them cough. They might cough, um, uh, you know, clear, feel like they're clearing their throat a lot, coughing a lot, coughing when they're speaking or, or laughing um, or exerting themselves. And it's often, but not always a dry cough. Sometimes you can have a wet cough as, as well. Um, people with asthma, uh, you know, we see our little little friend here with his uh, with his nightcap on. Uh, people with asthma often have nighttime symptoms. Um, you know, we'll often hear people come into the the clinic and describe that you know they're waking up at night coughing, um, or they're waking up at night just short of short of breath. So nighttime symptoms are something that uh, that is, that are commonly seen in asthma. And there's some, there's, there's some theories we can get into about why people might have more symptoms at, at night uh, that might be hormonal, but um, don't want to get too much into weeds of, of that, but just to make the point that, uh, that nighttime symptoms are, are common. You know, you'll often hear people say that they wheeze. So that's that whistling sound that you might get when you're, you know, when you're taking a breath um, and, but often when you're taking a breath out, that's uh, something that we look for when we examine patients with asthma, that they have wheezing when they take a breath out. That's kind of what we're sometimes listening for with our, with our stethoscope is that, that wheeze with, uh, with, with breathing out. And then some people will describe other, other symptoms, symptoms of pain in their chest or often tightness. You'll hear people describe that they feel like their chest is constricted that they're just having difficulty getting the breath out. So, you know, asthma, you know, not just from a trigger perspective, but from a um, symptom perspective has all sorts of ways that it, um, it can, it can you know, manifest itself. So, you know, we, when, we, when we try to diagnose asthma, we have a lot of tools, but, um, you know, the first thing that as, as doctors, you know, Dr. Morris, myself, um, Dr. Welsh, who's on 
on the phone that you'll hear from later. Um, you know, the first thing that we're looking for is just is somebody's is the story that somebody's you know uh, telling us is that consistent with with asthma? Are there signs and their symptoms consistent with with asthma? Is our you know our exam consistent with with asthma? But then sometimes we try to get some you know some numbers to see if we can you know make a, a firmer diagnosis. And how we do this is with um, something called spirometry. And this is a um, this is a, a this is a machine. This is a spirometer, and you blow into that machine. Um, you know, you take a full deep breath to your full lung capacity, and you blow out the breath as hard as you can. And um, this is done by experienced and, and trained technicians who are, um, you know, who who spend a lot of time and in, uh, in, in training, um, learning how to to administer these tests properly. Um, sorry. Dr. Morris at uh, at our hospital actually is the is the leader of our um, our team of uh, he he trains all of the the, the technicians and and uh, and supervises um, them in the in the pulmonary function test lab. But you know, so what we do is we have people take that big breath in and force it out. And with asthma, what we see is the the breath that comes out early at the beginning in the in the first second is usually decreased. And it's even though you can eventually get all of the, the the air out, oftentimes that that air because the airways are constricted, it doesn't come out as fast and as much at the beginning as 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 you would normally uh, see with somebody who doesn't have have asthma. So this can be a very important tool for for making a diagnosis of asthma. And then sometimes we might give somebody a medication uh, that opens up the airways and check the test again and see if the if the numbers improve. That actually can also be um, consistent with with asthma. So we have a lot. We have a few tricks in our uh, in our toolbox for for making a diagnosis of, of of asthma. But this is this spirometry is a very very important one. So, you know, when I see uh, somebody with the uh, with with a case of asthma, you know, this I have this this picture here from from Google Health, um, but you know. Let me give you kind of a, a typical example of, of somebody that I, I might see in my, my clinic, you know, because I, I um, uh, have an asthma clinic. Sometimes I'll see patients who have seen other doctors and you know, are, are, are getting to me after, you know, uh, months or years of, you know, their asthma not necessarily being under, under great, great control. So let's just kind of pretend here, you know, we have a woman here in her, in her 40s who, um, has had asthma for most of her adult life. Um, she, it's been getting worse over the last maybe, you know, three years or so. Um, she's somebody who started on um, an as needed inhaler. And then over time, her doctors put her on, you know, other inhalers. You'll, we'll, we'll talk about a, a couple of these in a second, but she, you know, somebody who's put on, she's put on things like inhaled steroids, um, she's put on other inhalers that open up the airways and she's still not doing well. So, you know, this is the, uh, somebody who would come to me and see if the, some of the newer therapies for asthma might these, might, might these, um, therapies be, um, be good for, for her, but, you know, it's always good to just kind of go back to the, the basics and talk about, you know, just, you know, finding out whether somebody is on the right, you know, basic in, inhalers. So, when we when we treat um, you know a patient like this, um, you know we're what we're trying to do is you know make this airway that's clogged from you know swelling and mucus and constriction of the of the muscles around the airways. We want to make them nice, nice and open. So a lot of what we what we're giving are inhalers to the lungs that. Um, reduce this airway swelling and mucus and they relax these these smooth these muscles around the airway so you know trying to make this turn into turn into this so um and the the mainstay of therapy is uh is, is, is inhalation therapy and we don't you know we don't often you know think about how much of a miracle being able to give medications from a from an inhaler is but uh 
but it's it's worth uh, kind of you know pausing and 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 thinking about how big of an advance for uh, for treatment of asthma uh, was the development of the of the inhaler. So you know the inhaler takes a liquid medication and it and it and it spurts it out into a spray that gives a very specific dose of medication. So that's really really you know hard to do. And um, but these inhalers manage to um, you know to uh, do that, which, which is, you know, really, really important for asthma management. And the, the reason why it's important is you're able to directly give medication to the lung and it has fewer side effects because that medication tends to go just to the lung, though some of it, a little bit of it gets absorbed into the rest of the body, but not a ton of it, you know? Um, so you have fewer side effects from just being able to give the med deliver the medication to the place where you want it to, to work. But, you know, one thing I'll, I'll stress is, you know, when I see a patient like the example that I, that I just gave, you know, one thing that's important is the, the, the proper use of inhalers, you know, um, using an inhaler the right way uh, is the only way to get the medication to the, to the right place. And, you know, I've seen all sorts of uh, ways that people use, use inhalers, um, um, you know, and, and, and it's not any fault of their own. It's just that nobody, nobody's necessarily taught them uh, use inhalers uh, the wrong way. I, I remember seeing somebody a few years ago um, who, you know, really kind of sprayed the inhaler into the, into the air in front of her, in front of her, just like a, a perfume or something like that. And then, you know, moved her mouth into the, into the spray because, you know, nobody, nobody taught her that that wasn't going to deliver the medication, you know, effectively. So, you know, we spent some time in our clinic and it's what, uh, you know, asthma doctors all over do they, um, they or people in the other people in the clinic will um, take some time to make sure um, people can use their inhalers properly. If you're listening to this, um, to this talk um, and you have asthma, there are YouTube videos on how to use an inhaler properly. Um, you know, to get the timing right, to, you know, press the button, uh, press the inhaler, take the deep breath in, to hold it for a count of five to 10 in your head, and then release, and then rinse your mouth out to get any of the excess medication that landed in the mouth um, out. So, and also, you know, what can be helpful is using a spacer, which is a tube that attaches to the end of the inhaler that can, you know, help with the... Uh, uh, some of the timing of pressing the button and inhaling, helping that timing not have to be quite as, as perfect. So um, this, again, uh, just to reiterate, using inhalers the right way um, is, is really, really important. So, and there's all sorts of inhalers. So um, this poster um, is commonly seen in doctor's offices of the, of the various inhalers that are, that are out there. So but, and I'm not gonna go through all of the, again, another baseball analogy, not to go through all the insider baseball of um, what inhaler does what, but what I did wanna show this to you for is to show you that inhalers, you know, they do different things. Um, like I mentioned, some of them reduce the inflammation in the airways. Some of them open up the, the airways by relaxing the muscle around the airways. Some of them do that in a in a very quick manner. So that's what we call a rescue inhaler to, to give you quick relief when you need it. And some of them last a long time. And we call those maintenance inhalers. You use that every day, regardless of how you're feeling to kind of keep your airways and keep your asthma maintained under good, good control. Kind of like, you know, if you would take a blood pressure pill, you, even though you're not necessarily feeling that every day, you're doing it to maintain your health. And these inhalers come in, you know, different types of ways they're delivered. Some of them are a, a spray like you might be used to. Some of them are dry powdered inhalers that you, uh, you don't really feel a, a mist. And then the, you know, some inhalers, you crush a pill and you inhale the powder. So these inhalers come in all different sorts of ways that they're, that they're delivered. And, you know, with each of these, you know, the important thing is to to work with your doctor to learn, why am I using a particular inhaler? Is this an inhaler a rescue inhaler or a maintenance inhaler? And um, am I taking this inhaler the right way? Those are kind of the important, important questions. And that's, uh, that gets you, you know, 85% of the way there to, 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 good, to good asthma care. 
And then again, I don't want your eyes to glaze over with all the detail on this slide. This slide is just meant to tell you, you know, as, as asthma doctors, what we do is we try to do a stepwise approach to keep somebody on the least amount of medication to control their asthma. So to start at a low amount of medication and step up and add doses, uh, go to higher doses or add medications as needed, and then step down if somebody is doing well. So these are, you know, this is kind of the strategy that you want to want to use to step up medication to, until you get to the amount of control that you that you that you would, you know, to get to good control, and then to and if you're on too much medication, to step down to just enough to to keep a uh, keep a lid on 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 things. So, you know, so those are, you know, those are kind of the, the approach to some of our, our inhale, inhaled medications. But, you know, where we are today um, uh, in, in 2022 is kind of starting to transition into this age of maybe we can be a little bit more precise that maybe this slide of, um, you know, just having a one size fits all approach to adding and subtracting medications. Maybe, you know, we can be more precise with how we uh, give, give medications. Maybe one medication is better for one person and another medication is better for another person. And maybe there are, you know, tests and blood work that we might do to, to kind of, you know, peg somebody as, uh, as having a profile that's good for a particular set of, set of medications. So that's, and, and some of that, you know, we're, we're starting to get there. We're not quite there, but uh, part of that is been driven by our better understanding in the research world of some of the allergic um, uh, mechanisms that underpin uh, some types of asthma, especially, you know, obviously allergic driven, driven asthma. So a lot of research has untangled some of the um, individual components of, of what causes allergy in the in the lungs and what causes the asthmatic response in the in the lungs. And what this has done as given um, scientists and and pharmaceutical the pharmaceutical industry um, targets, allergic tar like specific targets to try to make new medications for for people. And so we're kind of gotten to that you know, um, you know, the future is now kind of thing. So we, we have all of these now uh, five or six very specific medications that are called biologic therapies. And these are therapies that are actually um, antibodies. So they're, these are, uh, instead of your body makes antibodies, but these are engineered antibodies against some of the things that cause this allergic response in the lung. And we have a few of these now. And these are starting to be the kind of medications where maybe we can match them to the person who's got, um, you know, a higher level of particular uh, allergic markers in their, in their blood work or, or some of their other, other tests. So, uh, and, and these, I think I mentioned this, these are, you'll see these called by doctors, biologic therapy. So that's kind of, you know, the, you know, exciting future for asthma, that there's a lot of work to be done to figure out who the right, what's the right drug for the right, uh, for the right patient. And you know, there's a lot of expense to these uh, medications as well. So it's not a so there is some downside there from a uh, from from a you know that that figure that I showed a few slides ago of three thousand dollars for asthma medications per patient per year. The, these new medications are going to make that go up and up and up. So trying to figure out you know who the who who to give these medications to, so you know it can. Uh, there can be a tailored approach instead of just uh, just kind of giving them willy nilly and causing more more expense. That's kind of our our you know what our next uh, frontier is in, in in asthma research. You know, and in in particular, just to, as in a little bit of a, a tangent, you know, one of these uh, or a couple of these medications target a um, specific blood cell that my that my research is interested in. This is a picture of this blood cell called the uh, called an eosinophil. And again, there's no quiz here, but this is a cell that's, um, uh, it's a type of white, white blood cell that's increased when somebody's got a lot of uh, allergic response. And um, a couple of the medications that newer medications target these eosinophils. And what I like to actually show is um, 
you know, what's funny is we, we're targeting something with a new medication that was just developed in the last few years um, of a cell that's been noticed in asthma for uh, for a hundred years. So this this picture is a um, a research article from a hundred years ago, which shows a colored pencil drawing. So these cells here on this slide are you know 3D rendering of what the, these uh, scientists from a hundred years ago drew with colored pencils from what they saw under under the microscope. So sometimes what's what's old is is new. Um, and as I said, we now have um, you know several drugs that target this cell in in, in asthma. And I only mention this uh, uh, because this happens to be uh, a particular interest of mine from a from a from a research perspective. So uh, uh, something that I've done a, some 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 work in. And my colleagues uh, uh, that I work with are probably rolling their eyes because they've heard me talk about this a um, hundred hundred times. So sorry about that, guys. Um, and then, you know, as I mentioned, the next frontier is trying to figure out whether, you know, whether we can we can do better. Um, can we do a better job of matching the right drug to the right patient? You know, one of the research programs I'm involved in is from the National Institutes of Health, and it's called the Precise Network. And this is, um, you know, I probably should have uh, made this slide a little bit uh, less, um, uh, again, insider baseball-y, but this, um, this trial is basically testing multiple medications in one trial, but trying to figure out, you know, blood, blood tests that are called biomarkers. Can we find blood tests that can help us match the right patient to the right, uh, the right drug? So kind of an exciting effort to, to try to do asthma research in a little bit of a different way uh, to be um, a little bit more precise, if you will, with, uh, with matching the drug to the right patient. And, you know, um, if, if there's if somebody, this is for patients with severe asthma, but here's our, um, our research uh, lab's email address if anybody's interested in just learning about our, our clinical trials, including, including this one. So, you know, back to, um, back to asthma triggers. So I want to transition again. I, I promised that we talk about what, we, what can we do from a non-medication perspective to, to help with, with, with asthma? You know, I, I, what I hear a lot, you know, when I'm seeing people is the desire to be on less medication, if at all possible. And I completely get that. Um, and, you know, that's what we, that's what we as, as, as docs want as, as well. And part of that, you know, starts with trying to avoid triggers um, to your asthma. Again, easier said than done, but, um, you know, take the example of somebody who's allergic to, to dust mite, who's allergic to, to, to dust. Um, you know, we make some recommendations for um, trying to reduce dust in the home. So um, that might mean, um, you know, if you have, you know, deep pile carpets um, and, you know, sometimes these things, you know, um, not everybody can afford to do this, but, uh, which I completely, completely recognize, but if you can change out your carpets and, um, you know, to, to, and have hardwood instead of, instead of carpeting, that can sometimes help because the carpet is, uh, you know, is where um, some of the um, dust mites and dust live. Or if you can ask your, see if the landlord is, is willing to, uh, to, to change out, change out carpets. Um, you know, washing bedding frequently is a big thing. Um, you know, dust mites live in, um, you know, in, in, in bedding and so sheets and, in, um, in pillowcases, changing those frequently, um, covers for pillows, um, and, and, and mattresses in, in particular, um, hypoallergenic covers can be, can be helpful. Um, you know, if you've got a down pillow and it's got a bunch of dust in it and you put that layer of that, that pillow cover, the hypoallergenic pillow cover, it might prevent some of that, you know, some of that dust that's in the pillow from you breathing that in at, at nighttime. Um, you know, avoiding, if you're somebody who's allergic to, if you've got asthma that responds to uh, being near dogs or cats to try to, you know, avoid those things if, uh, you know, those dogs or cats if possible, you know. You'd be hard pressed to have me, you know, stay away from my my cat. So, um, you know, so I so again, it's one of these not easier said than than done things. But those are you know things that you can do kind of around your environment to 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 help. If you're somebody who smokes and in the and and smoking triggers your asthma, you know, even if smoking doesn't trigger your asthma, you know, quitting smoking can be a huge huge help for for improving asthma. Um, you know, as far as things like 
like infections that trigger asthma. Interestingly, we're we're finding, you know, during the COVID era that people uh, people's mask wearing, at least at the beginning of COVID, and the, and some of the um, social distancing actually reduced um, uh, asthma flares in in people. So all sorts of things that you can do or try to do from a lifestyle perspective that might you know reduce your reduce your um, your asthma symptoms. But uh, but that's not you know. But again, it's not always easy easy to do. You know, another question I get a lot is, does better nutrition help with, with asthma? And, you know, I, I think this is one of those things where the, the answer is probably yes. You know, there's not, you know, we don't have large scale clinical trials for nutritional, um, you know, nutritional interventions in asthma. Actually, in the Precise Network, we're doing one, one thing to one dietary modification that might, you know, testing whether it helps with asthma that's adding some medium chain triglycerides to the diet. But I think there's enough, you know, indirect evidence to suggest that better nutrition helps with asthma, that, you know, um, a plant-based diet, you know, more fruits and vegetables can be, uh, can be important for, for, you know, overall health, but asthma, asthma specifically, um, that, um, that weight, um, and obesity, you know, uh, has a, has a big effect on asthma. So, uh, that changing diet can sometimes, you know, help with weight loss, which in turn can help with, with, with asthma. Um, there's a lot of complicated reasons why obesity makes asthma worse. You know, the, the, uh, a more amount of, um, fat tissue and the, in the chest and the, in the, and in the belly can make it harder for the lungs to work. But, um, there's also other, you know, there's other hormone hormonal changes from uh, from adipose tissue from fat that uh, seems to affect asthma as as well. There's also um, a lot of research about vitamin D and asthma. Some people really believe strongly that you know, that that lack of vitamin D, um, both from the diet and from sunlight exposure, um, is is a key thing in 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 asthma. Um, in making asthma worse, that uh, that there's more asthma in um, in the uh, Western world because uh, we have less vitamin D in our diet, we have less exposure to sunlight that gives us more more vitamin vitamin D. So, I'd say even though you know there's not a you know a smoking gun research paper that says better nutrition helps with asthma, I, I believe that overall that uh, there's a lot of good reasons to, to, to think that, um, that a good um, healthy diet that's you know, more plant-based, that's got fruits and vegetables is, um, is an important thing to, to do in, in asthma. In, in, in children, there's also um, evidence to suggest that more dairy um, can drive uh, more asthma as, as well. So, um, so I think a lot, uh, a lot there to, to motivate um, you know, changing, changing dietary habits. So that is the last slide I have. Um, so I think hopefully my timing is good for a little bit, a little bit of Q and A and um, happy to engage with my uh, fellow mission committee members on some, uh, on some Q and A. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Arcothero. That was, that was really great. That, that was a fabulous talk on, on asthma. Um, I have a, a, a real, uh, my first question actually has to do with that precise network that you were discussing. And, and uh, what I know about that is most I learned from you, but if the idea is that uh, you're uh, doing some research to see if you can fit the right drug to, to the right patient or the, dry, the right treatment to the right patient. And I'm wondering if you can share with us, are there any early successes in there? Any, any sniffs at, uh, at, uh, that, that you're gonna actually be able to do that? Yeah, it's a great question, Tim. Um, you know, I didn't mean to say that we don't have any tools right now to try to fit the right uh, right drug to the right pa uh, patient. But even before talking about that precise network, um, you know, there are there are some allergic markers we can test in the in the blood that eosinophil count that uh that 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 uh, actually again it's kind of me nerding out. I have my I do research in it, so I have to say that a little eosinophil <laughs> on my on my pin. Um, this is what this is what happens when you think about one one thing too too much. Um, 
but um, you know, we can test the blood levels of this cell and that can help us to, you know, some people who have a higher blood level, they actually respond more to these, to these therapies. So it's a little bit getting toward tailoring, uh, tailoring the therapy, but it's not a perfect, you know, it's not like, you know, measuring yourself for a suit and knowing that, you know, if, if, I, if my, if I, you know, measure my, my, my inseam and I get that tailored, that it's going to fit that perfectly. It's just, it's not that, not that, not that great. But as far as this precise network, um, jury's still out. We're still, you know, analyzing, analyzing data. But I think, I think at the end of the day, we will find a few things that, uh, and, the, and the thing about this trial is, as we go along, we're going to change it a little bit to see if we can get closer and closer to um, um, to finding some blood markers for each of these medications that uh, that that helps um, you know again be a little bit more like tailoring a, a suit. But you know, I wish I had something more specific to report right now. But still, still early days. Let me ask a real basic question about that, and that is: uh, Is it important for people to understand if they have asthma or COPD or some weird mix of the two? Does that does that lead you down a, a treatment path? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a great question. I get that you know, and I get that question a lot. People with asthma are worried that, and you, I'm sure you do uh, as well. Um, people are worried that they have 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 COPD, um, and. You know, I think the the way that I would I would look at this is it, what, what's confusing about this is you know I, I, I talked about those those spirometry tests that uh, that that we get to diagnose asthma and when we that that pattern I was telling about in, in asthma that uh, where that that the, the early part of the breath is 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 reduced in, in particular um, you know that's a pattern we see in in COPD as well and we talk about all of these things under a kind of a bigger term of obstructive lung diseases. That's kind of our medical, medical way to, to, to talk about these. So people often think, you know, uh, because they see their report that says they have a obstructive, you know, uh, lung function test that they wonder, do they have COPD? Because that stands for a chronic obstructive pulmonary, uh, pulmonary disease. But I'd say, you know, in general, we think about COPD as not always, but almost usually as being smoking related. So it's a smoking related lung, lung disease, though, uh, and, and asthma, not necessarily smoking related, but, but they're very related in kind of the way that ways that they work. So a lot of the medications are common to them. And then there's some people who have a little bit of both. They might've smoked, but also have some, uh, some asthma. So, you know, so the medications for asthma, you know, most or all of them are also effective for COPD and, and, and vice, vice versa. So in COPD, you also want to try to, you know, open up the airways. Um, so it's, you're using the same, same toolkit. So, um, so a lot of people are, because of that term, term obstructed, uh, obst you know, uh, obstructed will, um, will, will wonder whether they actually have COPD, but, but I think kind of in, in broad terms, you know, if it's not a smoking related lung disease, I would call, I wouldn't call it COPD. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think, Dr. Morris? Is that uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I struggle with that myself because sometimes, as you know, it's not entirely uh, easy to tell the difference between the two. But I think that maybe uh, if I really thought that somebody had asthma and not COPD, I would be more tempted to use some of the more targeted therapies that you discussed uh, j just now. Whereas you, you're right, the overall, the broader ones about just opening the airways up would be applicable to both. Yeah, and what's interesting is, you know, there are probably some people with COPD we're learning more who, even though they have smoking-related lung disease, they're they they they're some of the allergic things in the environment might actually make their, you know, make them have flares of their of their COPD or make them feel feel worse. So some of these newer medications for asthma are being tested in at least certain groups with 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 COPD um, to see whether, um, you know, so, some people might might benefit. Um, with, with, with COPD. So there's always these little bit of, little bit of overlaps there. Yeah. Let me switch gears and ask a different question. And, and uh, the, I, got, I got this question from when I used to volunteer under uh, Dr. Welsh's supervision. And he uh, ran with the Lung Association this, this camp for asthmatic kids. And, and one of the things that I learned by uh, working at, at this camp was that kids, if you ask them how bad is your asthma, they'll, they'll grossly underestimate that. They'll always say, yeah, it's all right. 
And then if you ask him a specific question, like how often do you wake up at night? And they might say, you know, three or four times a week or do something horrific uh, like that. And they'd still say that, you know, their asthma wasn't that bad. And my question is, it may be to you and to Dr. Welsh as well, is is that common in, in, uh, in people that have asthma that if you ask them how it is, they'll say, man, it's okay, you know, no worries. But then, the, but they're really underestimating they're far more serious than they're given credit for. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that I see as well. You know, I think there's people on both sides of the, of the spectrum, right? There's, uh, you know, because shortness of breath is a funny thing, right? It's a very, there's, you know, we've had other talks in this dinner of the do, uh, dinner with docs about, you know, mind body connection and, uh, you know, the perception of, of breathlessness and, you know, and it's and different people are, are different. Some people are more, more, more sensitive to, to, to that. Um, and some people are, are, are less, less sensitive to that. So I, I definitely have, you know, many patients who, yeah, they, they kind of subconsciously, you know, or unconsciously reduce their amount of activity. Um, you know, they think, you know, they, they kind of accept that how they're feeling is fine, even if there's improvement to be, to be had. Um, so yeah, definitely that's something that, uh, that can be, that can be seen. And that's where sometimes numbers can be, can be helpful. You know, numbers are not the end all, end all be all of, you know, getting those, those lung function tests, but, uh, you know, uh, seeing that somebody's got low lung function and that those numbers improve with, with, with treatment can, uh, um, can be, can be helpful. Dr. Welsh. Yeah, Tim, you, I, I'll, you mentioned asthma camp and I remember, uh, a kid who came to camp and the mother asked that the, we routinely treated the child with a nebulizer treatment at two in the morning every day at camp. And I don't think she ever realized that that was, no, that was something that was not normal. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you're right, these families and the children get used to this kind of um, living off, off three cylinders of a six cylinder car <clears throat> and it becomes a normal and until they get to somebody who can tell them that asthma is controllable and treatable, um, they just sort of accept it. And, it, and it's kind of sad, they, they shouldn't accept it. And I think the challenge for both physicians and patients is that they expect uh, a, better, uh, a better ride than they're getting, and it is very possible. And what's neat about what um, Dr. Ekthada is doing with the precise therapy study and with the biologics is, we pretty much have treatment now for all levels of severity of disease and uh, people just need to realize it and seek, seek some, um, some help and uh, it's out there for them and, and their lives should be changed as a result. That's great. You know, I, I, for, I wonder if you guys have, have any perspective on, on um, how asthma has changed over the years. You know, I, I, as you know, I spend a lot of my time in the intensive care unit and a lot of the asthma patients that I have seen over the years have been the unfortunate ones that ended up there. And I have to say that when I was a very young man and I was a resident, there was always somebody in an intensive care unit with asthma. There was, all, there was just a, you, it wasn't a normal day in an ICU unless there was an asthma patient there. And now I would say that's very unusual, very, very unusual that somebody ends up in an intensive care unit with asthma. And uh, I'm wondering about whether um, you guys are, are seeing the same thing is that, is that asthma management nowadays is a lot more hopeful than it used to be. Yeah, I, I can speak for kids. I used to go to the hospital when I started my, my um, practice 40 years ago. I was at the hospital maybe twice a week to see patients, and I haven't been to the hospital for the, for the child with status asthmaticus so where they have they had to be hospitalized. I haven't been there in, in months, so you're absolutely right. And I think the role of inflammation in asthma and the treatment of that inflammation has made a difference. So we have some great medicines that 90% of people can be controlled on if they just realize two things, they have to take it preventatively. And number two, they have to take it correctly. Otherwise it's garbage in and garbage out. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that as well. And the, on the adult side that, um, you know, my, my experience has been the same, same as yours, Dr. Morris, that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's seldom that we see somebody with, uh, you know, because like you, my other hat is an ICU um, ICU hat. So I will, you know, do some, some stints rounding in the intensive care unit. And it's, it's, you know, much less common, um, now than, you know, 
you know, my, the, 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 Tim, Tim, I'm saying this delicately. The, uh, the the span of my career is uh, is <laughs> this is not the is not the same as uh, is, I, I, don't, I don't know if I did is that delicate probably not. No, um, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, perfect, yeah. perfectly said. <laughs> yeah, but you know, co compared to uh, you know, compared to the you know, late '90s, or early 2000s, compared to what we're what we're seeing now as far as number of patients who are in the um, in the intensive care care unit. Is definitely is definitely much less with with asthma, um, and the you know I think the 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 best reason for that is is almost certainly um, anti-inflammatory and inhaled steroid therapy um, you know kind of really becoming the the cornerstone for treatment for 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 asthma you know we're learning that there's there are probably some people where it's not the best you know it's not you know there there's probably some people where the uh, there, there may be more downside than than upside, and, and and maybe milder, milder patients. There's some research about that, but I think kind of it, from the big picture perspective, you know, the, the 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 kind of widespread use of inhaled steroid therapy has has been, has made a huge difference in uh, in people getting really really sick from asthma. Great. Uh, and my, my final question uh, actually has to do with uh, next week's talk, where we're going to be talking about environmental factors in lung disease. And this is really addressed to both of the asthma specialists. Is, is that a problem in San Diego? Have you noticed in your practice, do environmental factors really influence the onset or the worsening of, of asthma in your patient populations? Um, I can start um, and then hand it over to Mike. Uh, I did short answer is yes, right? And I can give a couple of specific, uh, specific examples. Um, you know, wildfires. Um, you know, uh, people who have been um, had exposure to, to to wildfires in in recent recent years. You know, um, we've had less so in, in San Diego County, but even uh, I've had. Uh, but but we've had some, and then I've had some patients who have moved from Northern California to Southern California who have described some very dramatic um, uh, asthma uh, flaring with uh, with wildfire exposure. We also had a you know um, recently a um, few months of last year, a few months ago, the you know battleship uh, fire in the in the in the harbor, and that seemed to to correlate with a fair amount of worsening of of asthma as well. Yeah, Tim, let me say this about environmental control for asthma. It's important, but, and it's, it's less important than what it used to be because of the, the good therapy we now have. Um, patients have to lead normal lives. And part of that is unfortunately going through the, you know, the minefields of the environment. And uh, there are some great um, uh, situations where environment changes can make a big difference. And the biggest are in the the case of uh, animal dander and living with a pet and, and, and a few other examples. But for the most part, particularly in kids who can't avoid much of what, you know, they're often either allergic to or, or have, a, have as, a, as a trigger such as viral infections, they have to lead a normal life. And so this stresses again, why um, regular therapy for prevention can be not only important, but make it so that you, you, the child's and the family's life does not have to be significantly altered from the standpoint of environmental control measures. So that's the nice thing about the new therapies that we have now that we can pretty much, you know, uh, sort of decrease the, the stress needed on environmental control measures and, and lean a little bit more on just making sure they're, they're taking their prevention program. Great. Well, um, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Akathoda. That was a, that was a really fascinating talk, and thanks uh, especially to both of the asthma specialists for uh, this panel discussion. I think it really uh, brought home a lot of the one, uh, wonderful points. So um, I thank you all uh, for uh, for watching, and uh, stay tuned next week when we do uh, get a little bit more into environmental factors. Thanks. That's it. Hey, hey, Praveen. Yeah. Nice presentation, man. You have some very nice slides. Your oh, your thanks. manner is so uh, so uh, uh, appealing. You yeah. did a nice job. I agree. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate that, Mike. That was excellent, Praveen. It, I echo um, the comment that uh, Dr. Welsh made. Uh, excellent. So clear. Thorough. Um, Encore performance wanted down the road here. <laughs> yeah, um, sign them up. Can, 
can can we can we re is record still on can you get a clip of that for my mother please <laughs> <laughs> um, just uh, just uh, excerpt that out actually i don't think she'd be able to figure out how to play it but uh um, but <laughs> Yeah, these no, thanks. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you so yeah. much. And and Tim yeah. and and Mike, thank you so much. Um, really great, great presentation. And we'll again get this downloaded on YouTube, um, as well as you can find it on the uh, our event website too. So great. thank you, thank you. Really a big hit. Thank yeah. you. Thanks. Thanks. You're welcome. Yeah. Take care, guys. All Talk right. to you all soon. See you all next right. week, guys. Okay. Bye -bye. Next week. Bye. Bye-bye.